of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear these words from Jesus as taken from the Gospel reading, and taken from the sermon that he preached. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes on the cheek, give the other cheek. To the one who takes away the cloak, do not withhold the tunic. Give to those who beg. The one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Here is the reading. When you hear these words from Jesus, you hear this sermon, a response is generated, a, uh, a feeling is generated. What is that feeling? What is that response? What is that reaction? I can't speak for you, I can only speak for me, but I can tell you that as I began to prepare for the sermon, and I was really unprepared for the reading, I read through the reading, I read through the words, and there was a response that was generated, there was a feeling that was, that was brought forth. And that feeling, that response, that reaction was one of fear. That feeling, that response, that uh, reaction was one of, of shame. Because here you have the words of our Lord, here you have the words of God, and the question is, are you keeping these words or are you not? Are you carrying out the law to put this in a bigger kind of a picture, or are you not? And so I'm prepared to come into these words and reading these words and confessing that I do not do these things, there's fear and then there's shame. And so where does that come from? How is it that we read these words, that we hear these words, that we meditate upon these words, and the response is fear and shame? Where does that come from? Well, the answer to that is Adam and Eve. It often is. It's either Adam and Eve or it's Jesus. If you say that or that, you're most likely right 80% of the time. You see, in Adam and Eve, what we have is we have original sin. In Adam and Eve, what we have is the fall and our inheritance is to have that old Adam, that one who has broken the law, who runs from God, who hides in the bushes, who makes those coverings out of the leaves. And we hear that law, and we hear these words from Jesus, and unprepared, this is why we do what we do. Because altogether, we are the children of Adam and Eve. And this is our inheritance. Now these words are powerful words. These words go straight to the heart, straight to the guts, and they speak to us. And people not necessarily liking what they're hearing or liking what they're feeling will find ways to try to diminish the Word of God, to neutralize and take away the Word of God. And so they do it in different ways. On the one hand, you will have a crowd that will simply say this, you know, Jesus, we like your sermon. We're, we're happy that you've given it to us. It does explain some things about the law in clearer detail. And the good news here is that we're keeping all these things. We're doing all these things. Yes, it's difficult, and yes, it takes a little bit of trying here or there. But in the main, we're keeping these things. We're doing these things. We're carrying out the law. And so we thank you for that. And so this is the way that the Pharisees go. This is the way that the rich young ruler goes. They think they've got these things under control, but in fact, they are self-deceived. They have not yet considered the magnitude of their sin. They have not yet considered what it means to be a child of Adam and Eve. They are utterly self-deceived. And then you have folks who will say this. Oh, look, this is ridiculous. These words are too high, too elevated, too impossible for us to carry out. Jesus knows that. <coughs> Surely no person would ever assign to us a duty or a responsibility that we could not actually carry out. 
That's mean. That's cruel. Certainly Jesus is not doing that. He's a preacher. Right? Hyperbole and over-the-top kind of stuff. That's what they do. He's just trying to get your attention. But those words, as spoken, definitely not. That's impossible. Also self-deceived. When Jesus speaks these words, when he preaches these words to those who are listening, all of us, the original listeners, he is preaching to us the truth. He is preaching to us the word of God, straight and clear. And when we hear it, and we understand that we're not carrying it out, that we're a sinner, well again, that's where fear and that's where shame comes in. Now here's the thing about the sermon, and all of Jesus' sermons. The meaning and the intention there has not yet been achieved. Jesus' sermons are deep, they're dense, they have layers to them. And what Jesus is doing here by way of this sermon is not just bringing us to a knowledge of our sin, which he certainly does, but there are many other things that are woven in here for us to hear and to know. So what are these things? Well, just this. That when we go back and we hear those words, or we think about those words all over again, love your enemies, bless those who curse, give to the one who begs. We look to our right and to our left, we look to our neighbors and to everybody else, and what we see is nobody's really pulling it off. We know that. Except for Jesus. Because you see, Jesus, the one who is without sin, Jesus who is the righteous man, he does love his enemies. All of them. Jesus who is the righteous man, Jesus is the one who fills the, fulfills the sermon. Jesus is the one who gives all for those who beg and are in need. When it comes to the sermon, it comes to all of its requirements, and it comes to all of its details, we have to say, we have to confess, and we are happy to confess that Jesus carries it out entirely. Not for himself, not for personal gain. And much of what Jesus does includes suffering and abiding with us and putting up with sinners and unbelievers and so on and so forth. Jesus does it, he keeps the law for us. The law says do this, we don't do it, but Jesus has done it for us, and he has done it entirely. He keeps it with regard to all of the commandments and all of the things stated here. He keeps it with regard to the things that must be offered as penalty and punishment for those who fail to keep the law. This is why he dies. This is why he rises. He does this for us. And you see, it's now with that understanding that we have the forgiveness of sins established in our hands, not to be taken away because of Christ's works, because of His love for us, because of His death and His resurrection. We can now go back to the sermon, we can now go back to these words, we can now go back to the law, and we see it in a slightly different way. Not rules and things to do so we might have the forgiveness of sins and God's love. We have those things. We have them for Christ's sake. Rather, what we have now then is the pattern. What we have now is the path which is the Christian life. Where we do these things, not so much to gain something for ourselves, we do these things so as to aid and help the neighbor. And in fact, the truth is, this is God who is at work in this world through us. He is the one who is showing love for the neighbor. He is the one who is doing good things for our neighbor. And the means for doing it? Well, that's us. That's one of the beautiful revelations of the Christian faith when we finally work out and sort out the nature of our salvation. It's done. It's given. It's established. And now the things that we do in this life is not to get something, not to get paid off, but because God is working good in this world and He does it through the means of us. 
And then there's this. This is the last part. When we go back and we look at the sermon once more, what we see, in addition to the things already said, is we see a glimpse, we see a picture of what life will be like for us once Christ returns. Once we have been finally and completely purged of our sin. Once he returns to come to judge the living and the dead and to bring us to that place that he has prepared for us. That in these words of Jesus, we begin to see a picture and a glimpse of what that life will be like. And so consider this from the sermon. Jesus says that we are to love our enemies. And we will love them. Except there will be no enemies. Do good to those who hate us. Except there will be no more hate. We will bless those who curse us. Except there will be no cursing, only blessing. To pray for those who abuse us. Except there will no longer be any kind of abuse. We will give the cheek to the one who strikes. Except there will be no more violence. To the one who takes away the cloak, not withhold the tunic. To those who beg, to give to those in need, so on and so forth. Except there will be no lack. In this last glimpse of the sermon of Jesus, what we see is our own lives as they will be in full forevermore. In this life, we get a little bit of a glimpse, we get a little bit of a taste. When Christ returns, that's the life that we will have, and we will have it forevermore. And so in this sermon, we have all these things going on at the same time. We have a real calling to the confession of sin and the realization that we are sinners. We have a real revelation of the one who keeps the law perfectly, namely Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He keeps the law for us. We see pattern and picture, say, of the Christian life and how we are to love our neighbor and to do good for our neighbor. And we see the life to come when sin has been completely and entirely removed from us. And all of these things will be ours in full. All of these things will be ours because of the Christ who has been sent to us, who lived, who died for us, and will come to finally redeem us. Before this, we offer our thanks. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.